Hi, this is Tony Abatini, and it's game on Friday afternoon. I think winter is officially over. The uh, Our weather friends just left, and uh, they said it wasn't official, but I'm calling winter officially over. It is now baseball and softball season, opening day for the Yankees and Mets a few weeks away. And I know for me personally, this is the best time of the year. You're starting to see the green come back in the outfield grass the uh, baseball and softball players, I know at the high school level, they started practicing this week. Little League practices are starting also. Um, we also have our annual coaching convention tonight. This really, for us, marks the beginning of a baseball season. We'll have close to 300 college, uh, excuse me, Little League coaches coming to Orange County tonight. And for three hours, we'll share information and talk to them about all the things that go on and why teaching baseball and softball is, in our opinion, probably the most challenging and the most difficult. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the some of the guidelines and some of the bigger issues that go on uh, in, in teaching. I know at the 130 mark, we're going to have a special guest, John Penatella, who um, really is, is making a national reputation for himself as one of our college-bound counselors, the Bergen Catholic Baseball superstar, Iona College, uh, All-American, and, and now overseeing our baseball uh, program in the way of transitioning high school players to college will be joining us in the, uh, at the 130 mark. But before then, this is really about baseball and a celebration, and all the Little League coaches that, that are about ready to start practice. Um, we've talked before on the show about what to do, what not to do, and it was interesting. Just yesterday, I found myself at a Little League practice. I'm fortunate enough to uh, still have a son who plays Little League baseball, and uh, the manager asked if I'd be willing to help out, and I certainly said yes. I wouldn't be able to be there all the time, but uh, always love going back to Memorial Park and spending some hours with, uh, with the boys. And uh, it, it brought me back to some of the bigger challenges that all coaches have, and uh, one in particular, and I actually started laughing, um, the need for baseballs, uh, as crazy as it sounds, that those of you that are going to keep the, the kids interested and to get the most out of that hour and 20-minute max practice, and I'll emphasize that time again, coaches, stop thinking that you're going to entertain these little leaguers for two and a half hours. Uh, they're tired. They want to go home. Um, very difficult to keep their attention span more than that hour and a half mark. So for that hour and a half practice, um, and it's, I, it's a big challenge because I know most players and coaches don't have their own supply of baseballs, but the expression we use, it takes 24 balls to play this game. Uh, not two, not three, particularly in batting practice when you're trying to get as many reps, as many swings as possible for the whole team. When there's only five or six baseballs uh, that the team has, you've got a lot of dead time. And I know Howard Johnson, when he was here, we talked about how baseball in particular can be very boring to watch. Uh, at times, it can be very boring to play for the youngsters. Um, and so when there's not a lot of activity, this is where so many of the players on softball and baseball get bored, they get tired, and they decide to play other sports by the following year. So I don't know how you do it, whether it's the manager, the coaches, or, hey, everybody bring a baseball so the next time that we have a practice, we have at least two dozen baseballs. That in and of itself will, will take your practice to a different level in that you'll be able to throw more and be retrieving the balls less than that. And, and really for the cost of a dozen baseballs, which I'm, I'm guessing anywhere from 18 to $25, it's not tremendously uh, an expensive. Maybe the different little leagues or travel teams that are out there can uh, provide more baseballs to the coaches. Uh, but, but it's something that's a big issue, particularly in the area of hitting, where all the little leaguers love to hit, uh, which gets back to advice number two, spend more time on the hitting end in practice. That's the part of the game that's exciting. And knowing that if you think about it, how difficult it is to hit a baseball or to hit a softball. I know our soccer coaches will debate and our football coaches will disagree and whatnot. But I'm here to tell you that, that hitting that round object with a round 
object is probably the most difficult thing to do. You add in the fact that the ball is coming in from an incline. You have the fear factor going on. Oh, and by the way, the ball doesn't come in straight. Uh, pretty difficult thing to do. So certainly on the hitting side, spend more time teaching the next generation of baseball and softball players how to hit properly, which segues into another piece of advice, learning and, and getting coaches to throw more strikes during batting practice. There's no rule that says that you have to stand on top of the mound. There's no rule that says that you have to go through a full delivery when you're trying to throw to your players. I would suggest not only getting closer, but in some situations, depending upon the age, actually kneeling down so the ball coming out of your your hand is about equal distance in height to the player themselves. I know we had a Little League program uh, last week. Uh, A bunch of of, uh, coaches were in, and they saw these L screens or these protective nets that we use all the time. It would be great to have each Little League program, I know the high school programs because they have a certainly a better budget than Little League coaches, they use the L screen so that they're able to have the coach who's ever throwing batting practice much closer. And if you're closer, you're going to throw more strikes. And in many cases, you're going to be able to throw the ball a little bit harder. Um, so uh, the Little League programs that can afford the screen or if they're there, that'll certainly make batting practice so much easier and so much more productive. There's nothing as frustrating for those youngsters when the dads, again, with the best of intention, are trying to throw strikes, but one out of every four balls is going to the backstop or going over someone's head. Speed of play, we mentioned that uh, previously. Um, get in a habit. I know basketball has the three-second clock. When you hit a ball to an infielder or an outfielder, and maybe you have to out loud, use the clock. One, two, throw on three. One, two, throw on three. Just to give that young 10- or 11-year-old a sense of urgency uh, because you don't have runners and you're, you're not in a game situation during practice. A lot of young players sometimes forget that at some point they're going to have to very quickly get rid of the ball in order to record an out. And the the one two throw on three rule has been very helpful. As the players get older, they they certainly will have an internal clock. They'll know that if a ball is hit very hard, they have a little bit more time. If the ball is a slow roller, they'll have uh, more time. Excuse me. Um, and at some point, the younger players need to understand, and we'll call it speed of play. So, and when a ball gets hit, the, the little league coaches, the parents that are out there, just start counting. And at some point, the younger players will understand one, two, or three. Um, let's Again, we mentioned hitting before, and uh, yes, catching and throwing is important. I know at tonight's coaching convention, we'll spend probably half the, the time really getting the parents and coaches to understand how throwing, a, a, throwing an object, forget about baseball or softball, is a skill. It's not something that someone naturally does. Uh, yes, there are some that are more gifted than others at an early age, but that that's a function of mom or dad spending more time in the backyard uh, working with them and just simply having a catch with them. Um, but on the hitting side, most of the problems at the youth level, and we've said this before and we'll keep saying it until we see a big difference in uh, in young players around the country, is just simply in the setup, how exactly that young player looks in the batter's box. What do her feet look like? What, are his, what is the grip? Um, are, where are the feet? Where is their balance? Where is their posture? Where, where is the end of the bat pointing toward? The, the setup, or we call the, the, the stance itself, is a major factor in the success or failure of young hitters. Having said that, let's just make sure that we understand, and, and we heard this yesterday, again, uh, down at the Lily Complex you hear, you know, you hear all the, the cliches, you hear the good advice, the not so good advice, you hear the information that uh, that dad's dad told him, and therefore this generation will get it. This whole thing about, you know, step into it and hit. Uh, be very careful telling your young daughter or son to step into it and hit, because at some point you better realize that the men that you see on TV making a living at this game specifically the Yankees and the Mets, their step or that stride that they take to hit sometimes is less than two or three inches. That it's not about how far you step, which will dictate how hard you can hit a ball. 
um, that small little step really is just more of a starting position or kind of a trigger to swing the bat. So we noticed it yesterday with a lot of the young boys that their stride length, that step that they were taking was double or triple the size of the big boys. So right from the beginning, if you're going to give the young players a chance, watch their stride length. Just see how big their step is. Um, if it's too big, they'll have balance issues. If it's too big, their head is moving up and down. And we certainly know that if the head is moving up and down in any sport, you're going to have all kinds of visual problems. The bigger the step will also make it more difficult for them to use their back leg or the turning action of the swing. So um, out of all of the what we call red flags that we see, probably the big step is one of the is probably number one. The, the second issue really is, believe it or not, is the grip. Um, how that young player will actually hold the bat. Um, make sure whether it's the traditional knocking knuckles you hear back in the day, right? Whatever knuckles that you use to knock on a door, that's what you should be lining up. The problem with this generation, Generation T, as we called them last week, no one goes outside and knocks on doors anymore, right? All they do is text and Facebook and sit around and uh, wait for their status to change on their Facebook page. Um, so, they, you know, asking them what, what knuckles, knuckles you use to knock on doors really doesn't make any sense. Much easier if you just get them to understand that their index fingers, the fingers that they use to point, should be lined up. So if you were to grab any young baseball player, let them let them show you their grip and then just simply say grip check. And at that point, their two index fingers should pop out of their fists and they should be pointing in the same direction. Uh, again, just giving them the proper grip so certainly will be a big component in having them actually put the ball in play. And make no mistake about it, um, the reason why we stop playing baseball it's not because our throwing and catching skills are not very good. Think about wh whether you used to play or continue to play. The, the players that have the most success and really enjoy it the most are the boys and girls at the youth level that can hit, that can actually put a ball in play, uh, experience the, the joy of the ping or the crack of the bat back in the day and, and run around. So as an amateur coach, Spending more time on what we're saying is the most enjoyable part of the game, which is the hitting, makes certainly makes an awful lot of sense. We'll talk a bit more about the instructional side of spring and baseball before John Penatello joins us. And we're back talking baseball and softball. We're in New York, and the weather is spring-like. March 16th, tonight, mentioned before, is our annual baseball-softball coaching convention. Really the starting point of a baseball and softball season that's underway, certainly at the high school level and with Little League and whatnot. Um, we're staying with the cookies, as we call it, um, for some of the coaches and uh, I wanted to really just kind of finish up on on the teaching part with the six tips for the master coach. Um, I guess it might have been three or four years ago I wrote this article for uh, junior baseball, and it was really kind of an overview if you had to just have coaches really understand uh, what they need to do and, and whatnot. Above and beyond the instructional part, what advice could we give them? And really, number one is, um, and I don't want to read, but teach, don't preach. Be aware um, when you're just talking way too much for those 9, 10, 11-year-olds that uh, at some point we try to say within a minute at the most, I don't care what you're saying or how wonderful the information is, you're probably losing that 11 or 12-year-old. So just make sure that you're, you're keeping your messages into smaller uh, little cookies and not and, and knowing that a three- or four-minute monologue, either before, in the middle, or after practice, uh, will, will be great. But at the end of the day, you're probably not getting those youngsters to really understand. The bigger issue is understanding that once the game starts, coaches— um, how do you say this nicely? Just shut up. 
Uh, stop talking to them all the time during the game. We mentioned this to our players and all our, of our travel coaches. You need to have the players learn how to play the game with their eyes, not their ears. And the problem at the youth level, and you see it in soccer, you see it in football, you see it in lacrosse, um, it has become a game of audio communication where the coach is just simply, even during the game, telling the children what to do. And yes, at the younger level, you need to at times tell the person to run or throw it to first base. We get that. But by the time they're eight or nine or 10 years old, you're actually doing them a disservice by micromanaging the game. The, the, the time to talk, the time to dictate where to throw it, how to throw it, is practice time. And r really let them learn how to play. A ball that's hit to right field there's no reason why all the coaches need to be screaming to that right fielder to throw the ball to second base. If you've taken the time in practice um, to explain that if a ball gets hit the right field, um, you need to throw it to second base, the only way that child is going to at some point do it on their own um, is by saying nothing. And, and I, again, I'm repeating myself, play the game with their eyes. And, and, and it's tough to do. Uh, look no further than we'll have, I know we, we have travel teams that'll be at the Rock Sports Park this weekend. We have our first series of tournaments and you will see whether it's the nine to the 12 year old division, five bucket dads, as we call them, sitting on a bucket, thinking that they're Joe Girardi, you know, or uh, Terry Collins or Bobby Valentine and truly over managing and calling pitch outs, telling 10-year-olds to throw curveballs, um, putting on pickoff plays, screaming and yelling when a bunt goes down where the third baseman or the first baseman should be throwing the ball. Yes, they might win the game. They might win that inning. But at the end of the day, are they really developing good players? They're not because, unfortunately, we have a generation of players that really can't play the game on their own because at a very early age, we as parents have taken the game away from them by constantly yapping all the time and telling them what to do. And again, this doesn't mean that in practice you say nothing, right? There's a time and a place to teach situational baseball. The game is not it. That is not the perfect time. Once they're in the dugout, to some extent, you can have that conversation. But the only way that you're going to allow good instincts and to have players learn how to react is for them to use their eyes and not their ears when they're actually playing. Let's segue out um, of the instructional end. And I know now all of a sudden we've got those little leaguers that are getting older. And um, this is certainly a time of the year be besides baseball and softball season and uh, everyone else out playing. This is also a time in which sophomores and juniors and certainly even some of the seniors are getting ready for the next level of baseball or softball. We've talked previously on Game On about college and the college transition and whatnot and the realities of getting that big-time Division I baseball or softball scholarship. We certainly know that an academic scholarship is, is more a reality than getting a full-ride baseball or softball scholarship. But at the end of the day, um, there is a college baseball or softball program for every high school player out there who probably makes a varsity team. And joining us now um, is John Penatella. John, I know you, you've been a, a caller at times here. I um, want to welcome you formally onto the show. We, we uh, introduce you a little bit as probably one of the best baseball players coming out of Bergen Catholic. Is, is that uh, New Jersey, John? Yeah, that, right. that, that is correct. After Bergen County, John went, up, John went on and played at Iona College, where he was a uh, left-handed hitting speed merchant and center fielder. Um, had some opportunities uh, after college ball, but like most of us, um, the few, the proud, uh, went on and, and had a great college career and uh, has been with Frozen Ropes for almost 10 years now. Um, John, the topic today is, is college-bound, uh, but I, I, I need to kind of make sure that we're talking about uh, one component of it, especially in the beginning, and that's really about skills. Um, our listening audience knows about the good grades, and they, they know about how difficult it is, but I, I'd like to spend the first part of our discussion on just simply not only developing skills, but at what point um, do you, as, as someone who does this for a living now, can start assessing where a player um, or can can be playing at the college level. So, on a skill end, 
Um, you're talking to parents. I know you're out talking to high school uh, coaches and athletic directors and, and parents now this time of the year. Let's talk about skills. Where do you start and what advice can you give just simply on what we say is the first component of College Bound, and that's having some skills. Well, you know, it, it, it starts, I think, as early as eighth grade, freshman year. Um, your skill development is crucial. Um, and, and the importance of training and, and really getting those skills to the highest level you can, um, <clears throat> I, think, I think is very important. I think that the big thing to remember is, um, as I like to say to the guys that, that we work with on a regular basis, um, you kind of are what you are at, at a given moment in time. However, given the opportunity to train and take your athletic abilities, uh, you're able to maximize your skill set. Um, and if you start as an eighth grader or as a freshman um, and, and really work on your training, you're going to have a lot higher peak level of what your skill set is uh, when, you're, when your junior slash senior year comes, when most players are getting looked at by, by a college. Hey, John, but let me... let me just, junior let me... and you haven't trained by then, you kind of are what you are, and there's not much that us or quite frankly anybody can do we can we can tweak you but we're certainly not going to make uh changes that are going to make you jump your skill level to another to another level being able to play in some different places john let me just interrupt and you keep using the word train and and i know you and i know what that is and i i think there's a lot of confusion um in that um we get all the time well my my, my daughter is practicing or my son is practicing and again for purposes of this discussion um, th- this is baseball and softball. There, there, there's no difference in what it takes, quite frankly, to um, to, to play at the next level. But I, I, I think a lot of the parents don't really understand when, when you make a recommendation, or even a college coach, uh, a lot of parents that come and see us, they've gone to a college camp, and the college coach will say, look, you, you need to be doing more training. That player then goes back and goes to practice with their travel team, with their high school team, uh, five days a week, participates in practice, and then six months later, they still haven't improved. I, if you can, distinguish for the audience um, what, what exactly training is and some examples of some of the players that I know you oversee and I know you're, you're, you're in New York quite a bit and what it takes um, in dedication level when we start talking about training that will actually make a difference as it relates to college. Oh. As it relates to college, I, I think you need a very complete training program. Um, and, and I think first and foremost, the difference between team training and, and private or, or personal training is, is very different. Um, you're not going to get the kind of training in a team atmosphere that you would if you're really focusing on a training program for you. Um, all the players that we work with um, in College Bound, they're broken into, into different components. Um, first off, to succeed at the next level, obviously you have your individual skill set, whether you're a pitcher and, and you're talking about your delivery and, and, and the different breaking balls you throw um, and things you could do within that delivery. As a hitter, uh, talking about making changes to hand path and, and your lower half and your vision, um, that's, that's one component of training. Then you certainly have your strength and conditioning component to training, which, which for I, every player we see, is probably the one place that if they really focused on could get them the biggest jump because most players we see are just too weak. Um, and and there's, there's some other important parts. For example, the mental skills side of, this, of, of the training. There's programs out there. Of, of course, we have them. I'm sure there's other places as well. Um, but the mental skills side of training it, is crucial, especially when players jump from the high school to college level because the rate of failure, as we know, jumps quite a bit just because the talent level jumps a lot and when that happens a lot of players don't know how to handle that and and they become kind of head cases we've we've seen that with some some guys um going through the program but some of the best players i I know we work with quinn carpenter uh from goshen local guy who um hopefully gets drafted early this year he's in three four days a week um, and he's probably the best player in, in certainly in our region um you know, and, and there's a guy that's uh, strength and conditioning. He's working on his delivery all the time. He's been in a brain day. So it doesn't matter your level 
or where you're at, how good you are, you can always take your game to another level by really training and, and having a personalized training program for you. Yeah, but, John, how does a parent or player know that? I mean, th that's great. You, you mentioned some of the marquee programs that we offer and, and other professional places will offer also. But I, I'm a parent in, of, of a high school player. Uh, how do I know w where the strength and weaknesses are? You know, you, you look at the, the Little League All-Stars and they make a modified team and they hit 425 on the JV and they make a varsity team. Um, at, at some point, and how does someone get an assessment like that, which quite frankly, I'm guessing, and I, I don't want to play devil's advocate, an assessment like that would probably cost thousands of dollars. Maybe explain what, what the typical parent can do that, that, that has a budget. How do they go about at least finding out where these different areas of training might be offered? Well, I, obviously I can't speak for, for facilities outside of, frozen ropes where, where I work, but uh, actually it'll cost you all of zero dollars to get an assessment like that if you bring your player in and, and say, look, we, we want to get our, our son or daughter to the next level. Um, we we want to figure out what parts of the training program would benefit them the most. We do a full evaluation. It takes probably a half hour, an hour, um, and, and we're more than happy to assist with that and say, look, these are the these are the parts of your game that you could really use some help and, and where you should be focusing. Everything gets customized. Obviously, there's budgets involved and money involved and what, what different families can do. But certainly um, to come in and get that advice and say, hey, where do we start, um, That that's right there at any Frozen Ropes location. All right, well, that's good to hear, John, because I thought the sticker sticker on that was going to be a few thousand dollars, and I, I think that's sometimes a misconception. P parents think that, boy, t you know, I, I need to spend a lot of money on different programs there, and you're right, the evaluation, even if they don't come back, just the fact that we're giving them, in our opinion, these are the things that you're going to have to work on with your son or daughter on your own or bring back to the high school coach or bring back to the individual pitching or hitting coach, certainly has some major value to it. Um, John, baseball and softball has become 12 months out of the year. Um, is it a sport now that if you're going to excel and play beyond high school, in your opinion, is it 12 months out of the year? Uh, i I got to say, I firmly believe that it depends on the individual player. Um, if, if a player is active, uh, they play other sports, uh, especially early, you know, freshman, sophomore year. Um, is it 12 months out of the year? Yeah, you might still want to pick up your bat and, and take some swings off a tee or work on something, um, but it, would it be your main focus 12 months out of the year in that situation? No. Um, however, if you're a guy that or a girl that just plays baseball or softball, you might want to have some downtime in there. Um, how much downtime I think really relates to an individual player. Once again, what, what can a player – physically and mentally handle. And I, and I think that's where a lot of people make a mistake within their training programs is, oh, that's what so-and-so does, so that's what I'm going to do. That doesn't necessarily translate to the best results for the player that we're discussing. I think it also depends on expectations, too, because if you've got a, a son or daughter that realistically wants to play at the Division three level, Division three being one of the lower levels, Division one being the highest, then her dedication or his dedication level will certainly be less than your ninth or tenth grader who has tremendous grades that has aspirations to play at the Division I level. And we know at the Division I level, more time commitment, um, higher level of play, uh, better facilities, and, and so forth. So I, I think you're right. Um, I, I think there's something to be said about break, uh, arrest. I know that we see at, at our facilities around the country 12 months out of the year, young players hitting and, and, uh, and pitching all the time. I think physically there, there should be a break. Um, and quite frankly, some would say that just simply the cross-training, um, just learning to be an athlete in another sport uh, is going to help in, in their competitiveness and just to give them that, that mental break that they need to go away. The problem becomes, and you know, without certainly mentioning names, you have risk of injury. Certainly yeah. in, in the winter time, as it relates to softball and baseball, and that's certainly the time in which most of the baseball and softball players are really getting after it, getting their throwing in, 
uh, really taking their strength and conditioning to another level. Um, to play a winter sport leading or that, that, that comes right up after, uh, with your spring season, kind of a tough thing to do. Would you agree? 100%. Uh, obviously, we, we do have players that do it. Um, and, and once again, I mean, from an advice standpoint and within our, our college-bound program, that's one of the main things we do. There's been times where I've looked at players and said, okay, I, I could see why you want to play basketball. It makes some sense. Uh, or football, it makes some sense. But uh, there's also times where I look at guys and say, hey, you know, you have a career uh, on a baseball field, um, and, and quite frankly, it doesn't make sense to me. But in the end, it's their decision, and they have to do what they, what they do. And sometimes it works out okay for them, and sometimes it doesn't. Yep. We are talking with college-bound superstar Johnny P., John Penatella, talking about high school and beyond. Talking college baseball, high school baseball, Little League baseball, you name it. It's just a glorious day in Orange County. The sun is not out, but it's 55 degrees, and it, uh, winter is officially over. That was a proclamation we made this morning. Uh, we are joined uh, on the show, John Penatello. Uh, John, where are you these days? Are you out in the West Coast, Italy? Where are you right now? Uh, right now, I'm, I'm actually up in the uh, Binghamton, New York area. Binghamton, New York. Uh, they got good baseball, softball players up there? Or? Uh, actually, th- there's some, some fantastic softball players up here. Um, and, and there's some, some very good baseball talent as well. Okay. Um, let's, John, if we can, we're, we're going to stay on the skill side. In fact, well, let's rewind a little bit. Last week's show, John, I don't know, know if you had a chance to listen to Thomas Bordenaro and myself. We define Generation T, Generation T of uh, the group of players that that we see um t standing for text standing for tired standing for tv uh how important in in the whole college process knowing that communication and reaching out for for schools and and whatnot um email texting coaches i mean we 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 certainly know that there's some ncaa rules pertaining to that uh, but I, i have to believe that it's easier now in, in this generation for players to get information out to some schools that they might have an interest in? Uh, yeah, I, I would say it is easier to, to reach out, uh, certainly via email. Um, schools are allowed to email anytime, and, and uh, you know, as a free piece of advice to, to anyone that, that's interested, yeah, if you, if you have a son or daughter interested in playing at a certain school, feel free to send an email and ask a lot of questions about the program to the coach. And, and most of the time you're going to get a response back because, um, quite frankly, they don't know who they're talking to on the other end, just like you don't really know much about them, and you might be the next superstar. So they will respond. Um, texting is uh, at this point, and I'm, I'm looking, just waiting for the rule change, but at this moment is the, a coach cannot text the player. And John, what about what about Facebook? I, I know you're you're probably you're a Facebook kind of guy. You're a young guy. You probably have a Facebook account, um, uh, telling people all the things that you do on every ten minutes in your in your day. Are you one of those guys? Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not quite there. <laughs> I do have an account, and I do make some statements every once in a while. But no, not not like some 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 get a little carried away. Uh, Facebook is. Um, from a recruiting standpoint, I, I, and some of our top guys that we work with, I tell them, get rid of the Facebook account. Fortunately, you don't know who's going to tag you in a picture or, or put a, a comment up there, and, and a lot of these college coaches, especially with high-profile guys, will certainly kind of stalk your Facebook accounts and find out. And it, It's been funny. We, uh, Yourself and myself, we've gotten calls from some high-profile colleges saying, hey, can you tell me about this guy and why does it look like he's uh, partying it up here in this picture when he's only 17 years old? So having pictures of, you know, young Johnny, 17 years old, you know, with a bong, you know, out on a Friday night or with a six-pack of Budweiser, you, you would recommend not to have that on the Facebook page, John? Yeah, I, I think I'd leave <laughs> that one out. <laughs> yeah, there, there's no question. I, I think the young teenagers thinking that it's funny 
have no idea that at some point someone who might be making a decision, whether it's a prospective employer uh, or, or a college coach wanting to know about one's character, you need to be careful. Not only in the pictures, and, and, and certainly the you know the uh, pictures I described were, were crazy, but just how you're talking and some of the messages and texts and words that you're using sometimes can be extremely misinterpreted. So you're right. I know both of us have really tried to tone down. If you're going to have a Facebook account, um, keep it PG, as, as we call it, and so that if anybody's looking at it, it, it reflects positively on you and doesn't give someone the, the opportunity to think that you're, you know, what, what eventually becomes a character issue. And, Tony, I think, I think you kind of mentioned this. We looked at it from one side. How, how much easier is it to get information out about yourself to colleges? Um, remember, with the age of the Internet, there's no secrets anymore. And, and as, as you mentioned, from a character standpoint, um, you know, it only takes one mistake. It takes one DUI or one, uh, you know, bad decision that you uh, wind up getting arrested. And that's... Uh, that's uh, if you turned 18 years old, that's going to be pretty easy for these coaches to find and very easy for them to say, hey, this guy's a guy we might not want to deal with. And, you know, it's interesting, John, you're right, but here's the hypocrisy in all of this. If you're really, really good, coaches don't really care how bad you are. <laughs> okay? <laughs> well, at, at, the, at, at the end of the day, you see this all the time. Uh, yeah, you know, Johnny's he's a really good guy. He was a Boy Scout, former altar boy. Um, goes and feeds the homeless on Fridays, and you hear the college coach in the background saying, "Wow, this guy must really suck as far as skill." Okay, <laughs> that that's typically the reality of it. Okay, Be, and, and at some point, for the parents listening, um, yeah, it, it's great that your son is is good, and and we're not we're not we're, we're not uh, un- undervaluing the importance of not having any criminal arrest. But at the end of the day, you know what these college coaches want, John? What do they want? 90 mile an hour fastball yeah. and seven, I'd say six, eight, sixty or better. Yeah, they want they want talent, and unfortunately, because this is the world in which we live in, no different than the celebrities. You know what? If you're a celebrity, you can go to jail five or six times and beat your wife and do this and that. It's okay. It's the classic double standard. Um, and so, yeah, in a perfect recruiting world, you've got tremendous skills and you're a good player. That's that's when you've got really something there. But make no mistake about it. Um, as much as every college coach will stand up in front of the parents at our camps and whatnot, and we care about your kid, and we really want them as a student, and it's important them to be really good, and we want your daughter, you know, to be a good teammate. Well, with the exception being, but if she can hit a ball over the fence or throw seventy, which in softball is ninety-five, we don't care if she's a jerk. You know, and, and we certainly can't, you know, the college coaches aren't going to tell you that. But at a very early age, and I know I've heard you tell this to parents and uh, players themselves, get great, have great skills, and everything else will take care of itself later on down the road. That's true. Um, John, if we can, um, we see this a lot, This and it, it we it. It certainly brought up quite a bit with us as far as video and, and YouTube and whatnot. Everybody is in such a big hurry to go out and film their son or daughter, you know, in their backyard or on the high school field or on a travel field or whatnot, and just to kind of get that video out there. And I know you, you and I have talked about the danger in that first impression. Share with us, if you can, some guidelines on why, when, or, you know, should you ever actually have that video out there? Um. Yeah, I, th- I think from the video standpoint, certainly a video can be um, very instrumental within the process, uh, the recruiting process, if it's done in the right way. So uh, first and foremost, I-, I think from a video standpoint, you want to do it somewhere right before your senior year uh, when most of the recruiting is done for the majority of players. And, uh, and obviously... That, that timeline changes if you're a superstar and guys are big schools are looking to get you to verbally commit as a sophomore or a junior, that timeline gets pushed up. But from the standpoint of most players, right before your senior year, it's when most schools are going to look at you. That has given you the most amount of time to train, to physically grow, to get stronger. Um, 
So they're really going to get a look at what you are today, and all they're really looking for in those videos is to see how your body moves and what your actions are, to see if that you're somebody really worth looking past or looking at, at some more. Um, and the other point to make about them, about a video, is please don't go out and, and make a video and shotgun it around the world to 5,000 schools, because when you do that, typically they go in the garbage. And, and that's straight out of basically every single college coach's mouth that I've spoken to. Uh, and, and the one last point uh, on a video, please have it professionally done, and, and whether it's with us or someone else, I can't tell you how many funny stories I have heard about players taking video, putting in slow motion, they put the eye of the tiger in the background, and coaches are, are at showcases laughing about this guy who stuck it up on YouTube and did you see that video, and meanwhile he's shown every flaw within his swing. Um, so make sure that, that when you, before you send that video it's looked at by someone that can kind of mark your red flags and you're not just showing your red flags off to the world. Well, John, it's interesting, but you know what? Parents don't know. I mean, a, a, a parent who is going through this for the first time, you, you, you finish Little League, you're in high school. And, and again, it is not the responsibility of the high school coach to market, promote, and, and be the primary person in the whole college selection process. The guidance counselors certainly, especially in the state of New York, do a wonderful job in starting to define and create career profiles, what you might want to study, what, what schools that you might be able to get into, understanding the eligibility issues and, and whatnot. Um, but you, you hear all these horror stories over and over again because kids don't know. Uh, and, and the problem is in the age of the Internet, everybody is an expert. Go out and, and Google college recruiting services, and you, you'd have hundreds of them that are out there. It, it shocks me. I, I think we need to raise our prices, John, because for what we do is a fraction of the cost of what these charlatans are doing out there. And you, you, you mentioned it before. They'll take a video. They'll send a video out to two or three hundred different schools that that have that, that that young student has no chance of either getting in academically or e either playing in, and the parents actually think that's a good thing of this so-called shotgun approach that's out there. But at some point, you can't blame the parents and you can't blame the the players because they just don't know any better. And I I, I think that this whole community outreach that that we started last year, where we're actually going into high schools now. Um, on our dime, they're free of charge. Um, this is not an infomercial for frozen ropes, just parents. If you're going to do this on your own, these are the things that you need to do to give your son or daughter a chance, and especially with everyone complaining about financial aid and I can't afford to send my son or daughter to school, these hour-and-a-half workshops, I would think, it, I mean, it's, it, it, they've been tremendously well-received, but these horror stories continue because parents just don't know. I agree. Uh, that's the best way to say it, and um, you know the information's out there, and you know I, I like to say, yeah, we we should raise our prices because I think on College Bound uh, our program we we lose with the amount of time and effort we put in, but I think we we sleep better at night knowing that the players we train and the players we work with, they got the best shot to play because we we communicate with coaches, we relay feedback back and forth to player to coach and then we talk to the player the player and, and his family and help them within you know making their decisions and and i think that's that is a, a big part of, of the program that we run and i think it's a big part of the process in general and just being able to have that that comfort level that some families don't have because it's their first time going through it well it's also a credibility issue also john because with the amount of emails the amount of video that a college coach receives Someone like yourself or Stacy Pelez on the softball side or even someone like myself that goes back and forth, when, when we reach out and confirm that this player can play, that many times is the missing link that so many, so many of these other people are, are, are not getting. We're able to cut through the chase, if you will. And if you're telling someone from Misericordia that Joe Blow player can play there, um, you – because you're involved in the skill end of it, and certainly um, it doesn't do you any good because your reputation as an honest evaluator would be affected if you're trying to sell or oversell somewhere. 
I, I think that's where we have some success in being able to do that. But it really gets back to parents on their own being realistic um, and, and understanding the difference between Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. And at some point, and we had this conversation with some of the young ladies at our place last week, um, the commitment. I, I, I don't think that a lot of players realize that if you're going to play Division One baseball or Division One softball, what exactly your day is going to be about and how you're going to have to make some major sacrifices that, that the normal student population won't have to make. Oh, I, I think uh, you hit the nail on the head and, and to, to kind of talk about that you mentioned the word that I say over and over when dealing with players that are, that are looking to play at the next level, realistic. Um, if I actually told you, I'd probably you'd probably yell at me. I, I was on the phone with a parent for 45 minutes this morning, um, almost in an argument, because he insisted that his son could play at a Division II school. And for three months now, I've had a Division III school waiting for him to commit, and, and he's going to lose his, his guaranteed roster spot because the father wants to argue that he could play at a Division II school. And I already know the answer. And, and I've spoken to the Division II coach, but they don't want to hear it because – they can't deal with the realistic, uh, his realistic ability. And, he, and he's a great player. He's a great kid. It takes nothing away from the player, and I think that's what, what people going through this process have to realize more than anything. Just because you're not a Division two or one player does not mean anything. It's nothing personal. It's, it, it may be your skill set, but the goal here is to play college baseball or college softball, and if you let the realistic schools go by you, because you want to play in a dream school, you may wind up not playing at all. And, and that's a huge mistake that we see made year in and year out. Well, and you're right, John, and that many times is parent-driven because at the end of the day when they're at the cocktail party trying to you know, self-promote themselves and, and their children, um, it, it's tough to say that your son or daughter is going to a Division three school. And let's face it, there's some Division three schools out there that – we don't even know the names for it. It's, it's a lot more impressive to say that your son or daughter is going to Penn State or Alabama or Florida or East Carolina um, because those are the schools that we watch on TV, and it just, it, it just sounds better. I, I think it's more of the, the parents, to an extent, kind of feeding their ego. But the reality is we see more Division two and three players um, and, and some low, mid-major Division one players, but – the, the sense of realism is, is such a message that has to be conveyed early on. And this is really where the high school coaches and even the athletic directors can certainly help in the process. Um, yeah. Hopefully they um, have gone and seen the difference in play between Division One or II um, where, where they can assess. Um, I've seen it many times, though, where you'll have the school say, you know what, you can't play at all. Because a lot, of, a lot of school programs don't realize that there's Division three programs and, and certainly Division two programs out there that, that can be a good fit. So I, I think at some point going to watch games, and I, I, to me, you know, especially with all the showcases that are offered around the country, or you go, for example, you're at Syracuse University, you're there for their softball two-day camp. Two days go by after you've been up there and you're entering into your senior year and no one calls you back from the coaching staff. That should tell you what, John? Uh, you're probably not um, <laughs> capable of playing at Syracuse. Right. I, I mean, and I think of the event that I know you put on in, in Orange County in, uh, in July. You'll have over 40 colleges there from Division One and Two and some threes. And at some point by the following week, if a parent hasn't gotten any response back from all of these eyes that have seen their son or daughter work out, there's that wake-up call that you need to reconsider and start looking at some other schools um, if, in fact, it's important for your son or daughter to participate in athletics once they leave high school. And it's okay if they can't. I, I think sometimes the parents can't come to terms with that. Right? Most people go on to college and don't play sports, and that's okay. Um, college baseball or softball should simply be – a, an activity, a hobby, a, a distraction, a vehicle, therapy, call it what you want, but most don't. And I think it's sometimes difficult for the parents who, since Little League, have assumed that, you know, little Johnny or little Michaela have to go and play college softball. Yeah. Uh, one, one misconception, which I'd love to point out real quick, because um, I get this a lot, uh, Division One, Two, II, and Three has absolutely nothing to do with the school's academic ability. 
And, and I've had parents sit down and say, oh, my son's really smart or daughter's really smart. I don't want them, they don't want to go to a Division three school. That has nothing to do with it because let me, let me just throw out a few names. Tufts, Johns Hopkins, MIT, all Division three programs. So, so I just want to point that out for the listeners that uh, – Division one, two, three has nothing to do with a school's academic ability. And that, that's a good point, John, because, you know, you look at the NCAA basketball tournaments that are going on now, and, and obviously those are all Division one programs. And, and, yes, there are some Division one programs that have tremendous uh, uh, academic reputations, but th- you're right, there's some tremendous Division two schools, and you just mentioned some of the best Division three academic institutions in the Northeast that are D3. Um, John, we're running up. Uh, we've got some time issues. Um, one last piece of advice that, that you could give out um, to the parents and, and even the players that, uh, that want to play uh, at, at the next level. Um, y- yes, they, they need to get better. You mentioned before, and I, I think you described about training and whatnot. Um, within 45 seconds, what's the last free cookie we could provide? Last free cookie? I, I, I think it's something that, that we kind of hit on already. Get stronger. If you, if you could do something physically, get stronger. And, and don't be afraid to get out there. Get an evaluation. Don't be afraid of somebody saying, no, you can't do this, or yes, you can. Uh, you've said it. There's basically a college baseball or softball program out there for everyone. It's a matter of expanding your choices and having an open mind. And, and if you get going in the process and do it early, You'll, you'll expand your choices, and you'll have a chance, certainly, to play at the next level. John, thanks for your time. Continue to provide those opportunities to all the young men and women out there. This is Tony Abatini, Game On, and we'll see you next week.